All right, it's our pleasure to be joined by Brett the Hitman Hart. We are here at the March of Dimes Canada Barbecue. And I imagine as a wrestler, Brett, you're always partial to the ribs at a barbecue. Uh, no, I'm a, I'm a hot dog guy. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, when you're going to go with a barbecue, you might as well go with hot dogs, especially when all their servings hot dogs. <laughs> Very true. Uh, you have now been with, with March of Dimes Canada, I guess going on 13 years now? Uh, that sounds right. Yeah, 2002, I guess, was uh, when, when the stroke occurred. And it's been, um, you know, a relationship with March of Dimes Canada that, I mean, this is obviously something uh, very important to you and, and making regular appearances on, on behalf of the group. Has it been something that was almost a, very much of a healing process with you having this association so close after the, your stroke in 2002? Well, being, being the spokesperson for March of Dimes on uh, stroke recovery, um, I, I understand. I've, I've been through it myself. The the long road it is to, to try to find yourself getting back to normal. It's really tough to do, and and it takes a lot of little people. When I say little, I mean just so many random people that are from physio people to the nurses to the doctors and the and the march of dimes people that all the so many so many people all factor in on uh, on getting a good recovery and. Uh, it's a it's a constant effort put in by a lot of people that make the difference, and I remember when I had my stroke, it was a it was a very dark time. But I had good people around me that supported me and uh, encouraged me every step of the way, and especially when it was uh, the early early stages of it. And uh, you know, I now I look today at how much I recovered and how grateful I am for all the the good things that those all those people did for me. Uh, this is my way of trying to give back. You know, this has been a year where a lot of major names in the professional wrestling industry have passed away. Of course, there was, it was Dusty Rhodes, Vern Gagne, and most recently someone very close to you, uh, Roddy Piper. It was actually exactly a month ago that, that he passed away. I mean, over the past month, has it given you a lot of time to kind of reflect on just the relationship you two had, which was very unique in pro wrestling of two people where a lot assumed that you two were family? Well, Roddy's a, a really a hard one. That's like losing a brother. Um... I can't say I've got over yet. I, I got over it. Uh, if anything, I haven't even uh, absorbed it yet. Uh, I find myself reaching for the phone all the time to give Roddy a call. He was, he was more than, uh, you know, so much more than uh, any of the other wrestlers were to me. He was a guy that mentored me and uh, helped me in the very beginning of my career. He gave me advice, you know, back in a time when nobody was giving advice to me. Always good advice. Um, and then not only that, when I wrestled him at uh, WrestleMania 8, you know, when I look back in those times, Mr. Perfect would be another one. There's a few guys that would reach down and help pull someone like me up to the next level. You know, you can take your Jake Roberts and your Hulk Hogan's and your, you know, Ultimate Warriors and a lot of these guys that were big names back then, but they never did anything for me. And they never helped me. They never thought of helping me. And when they had a chance to help me, they never did. But Roddy Piper was a guy that... Uh, <clears throat> looked after guys like me and a lot of the younger talent and when the opportunity came for him to help make my career and pull me up to the next level you know I owe a lot to Roddy Piper. What was it that, that Roddy saw in you so much because that was at a time I mean Roddy didn't lose to anybody but he saw that in you and that was such a pivotal moment in your career in 1992 with that Wrestlemania match. Well I think he, 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 rec he connected with me because we were both Canadian boys that uh, were in a sort of a tough man's business and both had kind of you have to make it in America and he you know he kind of took me under his wing a lot of the time but I think uh, I was, I was an up-and-comer. I was starting to really make, uh, I was starting to make my own uh, way in the wrestling, and mostly as a tag team wrestler. But I think people started to respect my uh, work ethic and my work rate. And Roddy was one of those kind of guys that saw that I was trying to break into that next level really hard. But like I say, a lot of guys never stepped up. You know, I, I look back on my career when I first won the title. Before I won the title, like before, after WrestleMania 8 with Roddy, I was told that around that time that I'd be wrestling Jake Roberts at uh, SummerSlam. Never happened. He got fired and had his drug problems. And, you know, he never never contributed anything to help my career, which was, is a shame. And then uh, Royal Rumble, after I won the title, I was supposed to wrestle Ultimate Warrior. I remember Vince 
tell me it was going to be a sharpshooter right in the middle of the ring. Never happened. He failed his drug test. Never handed anything down to anyone else. He left the company. All the guys that had broke their backs making him, but when it came time for him to make somebody, he never did. Hulk Hogan was another guy that was supposed to wrestle me the following SummerSlam. He, uh, you know, flat out refused to even work with me, period. And I just thought, you know, so I remember the guys that reached down and did help me, from Mr. Perfect to, uh, to uh, Roddy and so many guys that did work with me and helped me through my career, including Undertaker and Steve Austin and guys like that. But, you know, there was a lot of guys that were big names and, like I say, a lot of, a lot of wrestlers helped make those guys. But when it came time for them to help make somebody else, look at their records. They never did anything for anybody but themselves. And as you took that mentality into your career and your prime years, I mean, recently the WWE, they just put out a DVD collection on The Click. And they're very much a group now that, that is glorified all these years later. But you were there in the trenches having to deal with this on a daily basis. And it appears you were, the, you were the wrestler's wrestler that seemed to really stand up. And this was a very divisive group at that time who today, I mean, they're largely praised. Praised by who? Triple H. I think a lot of the audience, I think, just looks at it at a time when they don't know all the, the intricate details of what went on at that time. Yeah, cancer in the dressing room, all of them. And I think they're all, I don't think, I don't doubt that Shawn Michaels is sorry for a lot of that kind of behavior. Uh, Kevin Nash um, was a great wrestler and a good, and a good guy, but I don't think he can be that proud of that uh, association. Um, it was a, a cancerous uh environment in the dressing room with those guys and they did, certainly did more uh, negative than positive uh, harm to the to the business Scott Hall all you have to do is look at him he's a he's a train wreck with his own life and he you know he was a, a malcontent or a guy that you know when you were close to him long enough you you started to feel the same way he did you just felt so self-destructive and uh, unhappy with your life and your job and everything he, he was a guy that was infectious with his bad, bad sort of moods and bad uh, unhappiness in his own life, that was spread to all the other wrestlers. And you know, I'm glad I'm not remembered for that kind of stuff. I remember, remembered. I think if you if you talk to different wrestlers from that era, the Savio Vegas and the um, you know those kind of wrestlers that were on my cards, they're all pretty proud of how I conducted myself and how I related to them and how I I may have been the top guy, but I didn't act like a superstar not to my friends and not to my peers uh another dvd release the ww is going to be coming out with shortly is on uh, your late brother owen hart is that project all complete now have you sat down with them and done interviews for the project what can you tell us about it uh i'm looking forward to it but i'm not 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 really optimistic that it'll be very that it's going to be a great job martha uh, handcuffed them so much martha the widow of owen that uh Really, um, I don't know if they're even allowed to use any pictures from the past. Uh, it was very, um, it's a poorly done DVD because of uh, the, all the restraints and um, the limitations that Martha put on it. And it's a, to me, that's the, such a lousy thing to, to have happen. That Martha, I think Owen would uh, turn in his grave if he knew how much how much trouble Martha's gone to erase his career and to make sure that nobody enjoys anything about his career today. It's a bitterness and a selfishness that I can't stand by anymore. I, I think Martha's uh, taken the wrong approach and she should understand that, you know, we all miss Owen. We lost a, a, I lost a brother and I lost a great friend and, a, and my, maybe one of my closest uh, people that I know on, knew on this earth. and. Uh, I want to celebrate his career. I want to watch his matches back, not just with me, but with everybody he worked with. And his, his time with WWE, they got so much footage and so many great memories with Owen. And she, here she is standing in the way of that and saying, nobody can see these videos. No one should see anything that that's, you know, it brings back any of his career. So WWE footage, they, they can't use his matches in the WWE? Uh, they, can, they, they can do select things, but... They couldn't use any pictures from his childhood. They couldn't use any pictures. They couldn't use anything from Stampede Wrestling. They couldn't. They couldn't. They had so many restraints. Even the interviews, the questions that they did with me were so bullshit, and the whole thing was so bullshit that sure, there's an Owen Hart DVD, but it's the shits. You know, it's it's not the real DVD. It's not like the 
the best there is, best there was, the best there ever will be DVD that I did that um, captured so many of my great matches, as many as I could, and I had a hands-on sort of um, involvement in it, and it was a great project. And I was, at that time, I was, it was a big door to be opened. I was so glad to bring my career back and let people see what I was so proud of and what I was, what I fought for that day in, say, in Montreal and what I, what I lost. And so when they allowed me to do that DVD, I wanted to be the best DVD that there ever was. And I think Owen's DVD, I think WWE maybe had good intentions, but I'm not very impressed with the, the quality that it's going to be. I haven't seen it. I hope I'm optimistic. Uh, no, I'm not optimistic, but I'm, I'm hoping that it'll be better than I think. But I could tell by the questions that they asked me and the interview that they did with me that it was a very um, short version of and a very carefully worded questions with uh, bullshit answers and I'm not, not really gonna, not gonna hold out hope that it's gonna be as great as it should be. And I feel bad because that's uh, Martha's fault. Do you, do you know if there was ever, the, it was reached out, the idea of we're gonna sell this DVD, we're gonna donate proceeds to the Owen Hart Foundation, anything like that? Because I think many people are sympathetic to Martha losing her husband here and there is certainly a fan base no, that wants think, to see this. I don't think there was ever an issue. Um, I'm sure that the royalties, whatever, would go to Martha anyway. But she wouldn't have any part of it. If anything, she, you know, it's funny, Martha got the $18 million settlement and has now gone to school in Oxford, England, or somewhere, and has got a, a degree in psychology. But she should analyze her own self and ask herself why she's so cold-hearted and uh, selfish to want to lock up the, the, all the great memories that my brother Owen has that are locked up in, a, in uh, warehouses and uh, studios in WWE in Connecticut that, 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 that they're not allowed to use or they're not using because they're trying to respect her wishes, which is absolute bullshit. Uh, just before we end off here, a question I've always wanted to, to ask you. Uh, years ago, you, you had written about uh, a past altercation with uh, Jack Briscoe. What was uh, the, the rift between yourself and, uh, and Jack Briscoe? Because I think a lot of people on the surface would assume uh, the two of you very much would have appreciated each other's in-ring style, but there was always some personal issue that I think people weren't quite aware of. I, know, I never had any issues with Jack Briscoe. You were fine with Jack Briscoe. I was fine with Jack Briscoe. Um, was the problems with Jerry Briscoe that? Well, Jerry Briscoe was a, was the mastermind of the the screw job itself. But you know, I've um, I've been on good terms with Jerry Briscoe for a few years now, and a lot of anger that I may have had towards Jerry Briscoe and um, you know even Pat Patterson wrongfully uh, for a long time or uh, Earl Hebner. You can't blame most people for what happened. They they. They were just doing their job the same way I was. And uh, I, you know, if you're going to point fingers or you point right at the people that were directly involved, even Shawn Michaels has kind of washed his hands of it today and said, hey, I, you know, I didn't do anything except for what I was sort of told to do. The screw job was a direct result of Triple H and Vince McMahon. And um, Triple H was probably the, the biggest, uh, you know, the most responsible party of the whole bunch. Um, He's never apologized for it. I don't expect that he ever will. I don't know that you can, he rightfully could apologize for it. It's turned out to be uh, nothing but uh, gravy for him ever since, you know. So it's just one of those things. you got to do what you got to do. I, I did what I had to do. Um, I know I can look in the mirror and say I got all my integrity. I, I was legally in the right, uh, morally in the right, emotionally in the right. Everything I said and did was, uh, was right. Um, if you look at um, CM Punk, you look at everything that happened to him, he, he didn't fall for the same, he didn't fall for their lies the way I did and accepted. Like, you know, the truth about the, the Survivor Series is that I didn't even need to show up that day. I already fulfilled my contract. I was required to work uh, 175 dates that year. I was already at about 210 shows that year. I'd worked about 30 days more than I was supposed to. The uh, me showing up in Montreal for the Survivor Series was was out of respect for the title and the wrestlers and the company and the, the things that I'd done and the fans that had been there for me. I never wanted to leave the company in the first place. I was pushed out, squeezed out, lied to, manipulated. Uh, 
you know, and, and for them to, after all the hard work and years that I, and sacrifice that I gave to that company to, to screw me over in front of my family and, for, and my friends, it's a reflection on them. It's not a, it's a, if I've been a, you know, I've been a sort of beloved hero in Canada ever since then. So it's, it's always, uh, people know what happened. I know what happened. The Wrestling With Shadows documentary captured, for the most part, the whole thing anyway. But, you know, you see Triple H sort of hiding away and cowering from my, my ex-wife and sort of denying that he had any involvement. There you go. That's your integrity. That's your piece of shit right there. You know? Last question. You did bring up CM Punk. Are you going to watch his debut when he does fight for the UFC? And I think that, correct me if I'm wrong, I think you always saw a lot of yourself in, in CM Punk, and he was certainly someone that looked up to you. I'd be happy to watch. I think he's, um, you know, it's a very tough business, um, tough game. I got a lot of respect for all the UFC fighters and the dedication and the uh, sacrifice that they make to be fighters. But uh, I'm much more proud that I that I have made a living pretending to hurt my friends rather than actually hurting my friends. Um, but I, I respect uh, what they do and uh, the, the courage that it takes to go in the ring and fight that way. And I'm a big fan of UFC. I'm, I'm glad I watch it from the outside looking in. But I'd also say with Punk that he's, uh, from what I've known of him, I, and I know him reasonably well, he's a guy that um, doesn't make dumb moves and he doesn't make um, weak promises. And uh, he's a guy that's got a lot of focus, a lot of dedication. And uh, if he wants to go into UFC, I'm sure that if he believes he's a threat, then I, I'm willing to believe that he's a threat too. And, and especially uh, for that first fight, I'd like to, I'd love to be there in support of him. I know I will be uh, if I'm, if it's a pay per view, and I'm sure it will be. I'll, I'll be there to back him up. Well, Brett, we always appreciate the time with you. Uh, you can follow this man at Brett Hart on Twitter, and for more information on March of Dimes Canada, you can go to marchofdimes.ca.